I see a Mionics headset. Yeah, that's uh, actually kind of the first one. We had a prototype earlier, but this is our own headset from scratch. And we have developed these. They have taken almost three years. And it's called the Nash 20. And Nash, uh, according to Arabic mythology, uh, it's actually a star on the sky. We name our products after stars in the sky. And Nash means arrowhead. So I thought that was a pretty cool name yeah. for a, a headset with a sharp uh, sound, you know? <laughs> and I see where you're, where you're going yeah, there. Exactly. Uh, we have a two meter braided cable, go place the plugs. Um, as you can see, there is uh, no volume controls or mute functions on the cable. It's actually implemented already here, so you can actually hear a click here. So, let me go back a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, that's better there. Yeah. So, uh, you can actually hear it clicks here. Uh, and when it's up, it's muted. When it's down, it's unmuted. And here on the back, you have the volume controller. This means that you actually can have a headset on you and you can do all the adjustments with volumes and muting um, uh, with your left hand while gaming. What are the uh, materials that you're using for this? Yeah. Uh, we have ABS Plast and then the TPE headband. Uh, we have protein leather, uh, ear cushions, and headband cushions, and it's memory foam padded. So um, yeah, let me, let me see. So they're very soft. Yeah, uh, and forms off your ears. Uh, this is 22 millimeter, and this is 18 millimeter. It's very soft and comfortable. Also, the inner ear caps here moves in all directions, which also is very good because uh, you can tilt them quite a lot, which means that on other headsets you can get the pressure uh, below your ear. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tried to get rid of that issue by having this uh, 22 millimeter memory foam ear pads, mm -hmm. and also by having this one tilted. So it's also very good if you have a strange head. Yeah, it could be good as well. <laughs> so and the height adjustment. This is steel. Uh, this is plastic. Here is where the cable goes to the ear cap. Yes. So, but it's it's very solid. So yeah, it's very nice. Uh, also, we have angle drivers, you can't see it on this one, but uh, in here you actually can feel the edge, like here, and on the back, uh, you actually have an edge here as well. So they are tilted because the ear is tilted. It seems like a close back headset, but it's actually the same close back. We have actually drilled holes to, uh, and developed our own drivers. Yeah, speaking of drivers, let's take a look at what you have here. Yeah, so uh, this is our own drivers, this is the components of it. Uh, as, uh, uh, as you might know, uh, the cone here in the middle of the driver, that's the one pushing back and forth and creating the low frequency in the base. And this called the surroundings here on the outer part. Uh, that's the part that makes the mid and uh, high frequencies, uh, like voices and, and uh, yeah, when people sing and stuff. And with our open back headset, uh, you want airflow to provide uh, air to the surroundings but uh, if you make a close back headset, that helps to isolate the cone to give a stronger bass uh, or a bass. Um, uh, but with our uh, semi close back, we uh, get the best of both worlds basically. That you get the closeness, you get down below 100 hertz on the bass, but also uh, provide air to the surroundings. So uh, I I'm really proud over uh, the sound we, are, we have. Uh, shape with this product and it's going to retail for 129.99 US dollars. So this one has a USB, is this a 7.1 I'm guessing? Yeah, uh, so this is the concept of the 7.1 USB headset which has a backlight illumination uh, still has the mic muke function and volume control on the back but you also have a switch for turning the LEDs on and off. Uh, you can detach the cable uh, and yeah it's going to have uh, own DSP you can uh, change the colors, you can do all the Dolby uh, settings you can do in the drivers and correct the surround sound with equalizers and everything. And so. do these have the same drivers as the others? Yeah, exactly they have the same? the same driver, but this one is more, I say, a bit more amplified and you can tune the colors, uh, uh, sorry, tune the um, sound a bit better. Mm -hmm. So. And are you going to be able to turn the 7.1 on and off in the software or? Because like someone like me, yeah. I, would, I would like to have the USB, but I'm not sure if I would use the 7.1 for music especially. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, you can turn it on and off in the software as well, by the way. So. Yeah, it gives people options. Yeah. Yeah, so when we start to develop a new shape, we start with a, a big piece of foam. 
and then we start to draw lines and then we start to sandpaper it then we draw a new line sandpaper it until we're happy uh, most of the times we do many foams like this uh, until we find like a shape we like um, one now who's doing this? A bunch of gamers? Uh, or you guys? Or it's mostly uh, we guys, so I do most of the sandpaper performing. Um, and what's very important for us is the ergonomics. Like, you should be able for like the avior that you can full palm it and still claw grip it at the same time. Uh, so that was one of the key objectives to make a symmetric mouse with the avior that uh, could be both palm and claw, uh, and claw gripped. Uh, and we did that basically by having a very round back uh, which gives you the support for the fingers on both ends and you can actually see it here underneath that uh, yeah um, my fingers are like aligned to the roundness as well as on this edge so it seems very simple but uh, that's that's one of the biggest points of doing a ergonomic and dexterous mouse um, once we have done the foam and we're happy with it uh, you can see that like there is uh, bumps and other stuff so then we scan it in with a 3D scanner and uh, then we start to work with a, um, a 3D model um, once we have uh, the 3D model uh, if it's an ambidex mouse we do one side uh, perfect because then we just mirror that side on the other side if you do something like more like the NEOS um, we need to do every side individually, so that takes longer time to do something like right-hander ergonomic. Uh, once we have uh, all the foam set up and everything, uh, we actually 3D print out real samples. Uh, so this is uh, the first printout of the Avior uh, done in a MakerBot. So it's pretty nice. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, you do mock-up samples. I don't have the real mock-up sample here, unfortunately, on the Avior. But uh, what it turns out later on to be is to these real products. Uh, this was the first one on the NEOS 5000. It's end of life now. Uh, but this is the first mock-up sample we ever did. Uh, and we went more or less uh, straight to mock-up samples. So we had some foams and stuff, but we actually started with 3D and started to print out from the start. Uh, we have for find that uh, process since uh, uh, since we started. So this was actually made in 2009. Uh, this was actually uh, the first mock-up sample. It looks a bit nasty, but this is the first mock-up sample. That's on, the one right there. Yeah, on the NEOS 5000. It's carved out as um, like you have a big piece of plastic and then you do each part with a, like a CNC machine. So you actually do it. So this is, this is like the first sample we did. This is also 2009. We tried to do a white version, uh, so this is just a here for show. This is like a holiday stack of, uh, <laughs> of all the different products. What do we have here, Peter? Yeah, this is actually programmed right now as the um, as a Christmas tree. We just wanted to show <laughs> the different light things and do something cool on Facebook during Christmas. But one thing you can see here is actually the ICs we have in it. Uh, all of uh, our products has MCU, and they look a bit different, but there is one MCU, here is the MCU, here is the MCU, and underneath here is one MCU. And MCU is actually, the footprint is the same, but we are running the 8200 series with a 72 megahertz uh, ARM processor running 32 bits. Uh, but on the 7000 we have more or less the same MCU but running in 32 bits instead. Uh, now the, uh, the ARM processor, a lot of people are, are questioning like, is that really needed for a mouse? What does it do? And, and why, why is it needed? Uh, we basically use it for... Uh, there is a firmware and like a MCU inbuilt in the sensors, even if it's the laser one or if it's the optical version. Right. But uh, they are programmed in a certain way and we can overwrite them by using the MCU. So we can actually do, uh, with the help of the power from the MCU with our own processor, we can do things like tune uh, X and Y axis, uh, we can uh, interpolate in different ways and do it in a, in a execute in a better way than uh, an non-ARM processor mouse. Um, also, it helps to uh, get fast reaction times. Um, and also, we have memory inbuilt in the MCU, 
which means that we don't have an extra memory stack, so it's all connected. Oh, it's all, all integrated, okay. Yeah, exactly. So when you do macros and everything, those things should go faster as well when you have ARM processors. On the 8200, we use the Omron 10 millimeter switches, uh, 10 million life cycle switches. It's these ones. Uh, they look the same as the 20 million switches, but it's a different feather on the inside. So that's basically the only difference, but the tactile feel are a bit different as well between them. Uh, both are very good switches with long lifetime, but we're upgrading all the whole range to 20 million right now. Um, uh, my favorite switches though, th this is mine as, as yeah. Ethan Iron, not my Onyx, is actually that I like the TTCs. That's the ones we have here on the side buttons. Uh, very hard to see. But they have a very crispy and very tactile feel, um, while the armorons are a bit more soft. But one thing that we think is very important is that even if we use a different set of switches, uh, uh, we still want to have a very similar actuation force. When it comes to the 7000, uh, uh, this I see here, the ADNS 3310, uh, which is pretty heavy. That's the drawback with that sensor compared to the laser one, which is very, very light. Um, it's um, uh, it doesn't have any um, positive or negative hardware acceleration. Unfortunately, this laser sensor does. Uh, Pixar and Abago, who makes the sensors, mm -hmm. um, they haven't uh, made the algorithms good enough uh, for the laser sensors. It's possible to make the laser sensors without any accelerations, and we have even tried to pro reprogram them, but because it's a bit uh, inaccurate, it's either positive or negative, and it can come whenever. Uh, even if it's just small acceleration differences, it's inaccurate. We cannot reprogram the algorithms. Uh, but the Avr 7000 is good from the start. So actually, it's the only difference is the lightning technique. Like when it comes to optical. Uh, Thing, it's more or less the same, even if they look very different, the opticals it's actually more or less the same. It's just easier to integrate uh, laser into the ICs. Here you actually need to have the LED lights over here, and that's why it's also heavier, and you need a wider lens, which also add on weight. So, uh, and you see, this takes a lot of space, uh, and this one is very small and doesn't take up that much space. So, uh, there is pros and cons.